Bibliosophie. Je réessaye. Hello, welcome. My name is Sophie. I am coming to you from France right now, and I need to start doing some reading. I posted a video last week, yes, week and a half ago, something like that, about my uh, reading plans for the summer, and I've not really, really been making good on those plans. So today is June 21st. It is the solstice. It is officially the start of summer. Let's get cracking on that summer reading. I mentioned that I would be starting The Magic Mountain by Thomas Mann. I have the, oh, I forgot her name, I'm sorry, uh, the Low Porter translation, as I mentioned in my previous video. There is also a Woods translation that I have as an ebook. I also have access to this translation as an audiobook. So I think I'm going to be swimming through kind of all three versions, the two uh, low porter, uh, both text and audio versions, and comparing it sometimes with the Woods translation of the book. But we are officially starting this quite soon. I don't know if I'm going to start it immediately because I am also in the process of reading a couple of other books that I mentioned also in my previous video. Uh, I'm about 40 pages into Near to the Wild Heart by Clarice Lispector. I think I'm going to try to read this one pretty quickly this week, actually. Uh, it is quite short, although with Lispector, I find that it always takes me quite a while. I actually still have not finished A Breath of Life. I also left it in New York, so I think it's just not going to be finished until the end of July, uh, which is unfortunate because I only had, I think, something like 50 pages, 40, 50 pages left, but it's fine. I will get back to it later this summer. So it's it can be hard for me to read a lot of pages of hers at once, um, but we'll see. I'm going to see if I can kind of be a little bit more systematic about reading this one. So far, I'm enjoying it. So far, it is very much a Lispector book uh, with a lot of the themes that I'm used to seeing in her uh, other books, concerns about infinity and creation and imagination and thought process and kind of self. Um, this is her first novel that she wrote when I, I believe she was only 23, so this is, you know, a young prodigious uh, offering, but I'm planning to really enjoy it. I've only read the very first essay of Death by Landscape by Elvia Wilk. Yes, excuse me. I just had a brain panic moment, Elvia Wilk, uh, which I really enjoyed. I will probably dip in and out of this over the course of the next few weeks. I read my the one and only chapter that I read in the plane here. This was the only thing I read in the plane. I had both of these on me plus my iPad and I did nothing. Oh, actually that's a lie because the third book that I'm in the process of, holding this upside down, is the first of the Neapolitan trilogy not trilogy, now, uh, Quartet by Elena Ferrante, uh, my brilliant friend, L'Amica Geniale. Uh, I have this both as an ebook in Italian and as an audiobook that I've been listening to. So I have that out from Libby and I've been, I, I'm almost done with it. I think that's going to be my first order of business is to finish Ferrante endless specter and as soon as i do that ideally in the next few days i'm going to start up on this guy so that is the plan we'll see I'll keep you updated so it's currently 10 p.m right now i'm walking by the ocean and it's absolutely beautiful Okay, so I 
am about halfway, no, more than halfway. I am 122 pages of not quite 200 through Near to the Wild Heart, and I want to talk about it briefly. Then I have to go unpot or unearth a rose bush. I have a hard time formulating my thoughts around Clarissa Spectre. I'm sure I'm hardly the only one to have this problem. It's just so much, it's so opaque. I was messaging with uh, Mika the other night, and with whom I'm doing this buddy read, by the way, and we were talking about the fact that this is not quite as opaque as some of the Spectre's other books, but still, there are just so many thoughts that start whirring around in my head. I don't know if some of them are also because I've read, at this point, a number of her other books, and so I'm seeing so many themes, and so there's always this kind of constellation of themes and thoughts that are always interconnected and that occur when I read Le Spectre, and I think increasingly there is something clarifying in reading more of her work because I am really, really seeing the themes of her thought process develop, but it doesn't really make the reading process clearer in some ways because it means that every thought becomes a rhizome of thoughts even more because I'm constantly relating it to her other books as well, her other writings. So all of that to say that I am, as I have been in the past on these videos, very much a whir with um, soul activity, let's say it that way. That's why I have some tabs, because I've been taking quite a lot of notes in addition to just underlining. I've actually been taking some various notes. So what do I want to talk about? Partially I tabbed this so that I could kind of quickly get to things. Oh, I forgot to tab this. Um, yeah, that's fine. <laughs> Isn't this fun? Aren't you glad to watch me try to read through my notes? Um, some of the themes that I want to talk about. Life and death. This is very, very much present in her work. Uh, having not quite finished Pulsations or Breath of Life most recently of hers, I'm really, really thinking about life and death, the creation of life, and this string was annoying me, um, and what it means to live, what it means to die in Clarice Lispector's work. But in this, I'm seeing it a lot as well. And then if there is life, on one end and there's death on the other end of a sort of chronology, what is it filled with? I think Le Spectre is really thinking a lot about that in-between stuff that is way more uncomfortable. There is the concept of coming into life, which is already difficult in its own way, and death, which is also, also difficult in its own way, but concrete to some extent. And in the middle business, there is existence and being and living and how are those three things different from one another how are they the same how is life li and living or how are life excuse me and living different from one another what is it to live as a human being versus a non-human animal what is the line between the biological self and the internal self how do they grow in tandem, at odds with one another? This is sort of a coming of age novel in a lot of ways. We're following the story of Joanna, who is sort of a Clarice Lispector figure. Although the perspective shifts in, in sometimes kind of very blurry, sneaky ways. We're in third person, vaguely omniscient narrator, most of the time from Joanna's point of view, but also sometimes from others, especially increasingly her husband later on, uh, Ottavio. So Lispector is kind of weaving into different perspectives in a way that is 
can be a little discombobulating actually and subtle because you sort of realize that you've been hearing Liz Spector's voice and you slipped into Joanna's voice, internal monologue, and then you've slipped into another person's. So it's, it's very kind of sneaky and uh, can be a little difficult to keep track of. As I've said in previous videos about Liz Spector, the thing I think to do is just kind of to swim in it. I likened reading Liz Spector also in uh, messages with Mika to swimming. Um, and it's maybe because I have been doing a lot of swimming also, so I'm thinking about swimming a lot. But for me, it's really like swimming in the ocean and you have to let yourself be taken by currents sometimes. And there's this simultaneous clarity of breaking the water, but also feeling that all of it is enveloping you. And it's so much larger than your particular perspective, but your particular perspective is kind of the thing that's breaking through the, the whole mass that is kind of simultaneously clear and dense all at once. Um, so for me, reading Clarice Lispector is like swimming in a very large body of water and all of the surprises, the heft and surprises that it brings about. I got off on eight different tangents, but I was thinking about the concept of being human. So yes, this is sort of a coming of age and we're seeing Joanna grapple with the idea of self-formation and to a certain extent Lispector grapple with formation of both herself but also her characters and how do you write formation. There's this recurring theme of what is a thought and what is the existence of a thought? How does it come into being? How does it join up with eternity? How does it attempt to describe eternity? What is, what is the seed of thought? What is the seed of being? And how does it grow? How does it expand? What makes a human animal an animal? What makes them a human being? In what way is Joanna going to grow? It se there seems to be a simultaneous growing outward. So even just physically her body, there's talk of how her body is changing as she grows older and matures, but then also in her rapport with others, her the kind of connections, her the root formation that she's making uh, in her, her sociality with others. And then within, how is she growing inward? How, how is she expanding from the inside? I'm sort of picturing Joanna and by extension Clarice and maybe by extension me, because I think I'm reading myself into this so, so much all the time as a coming of age that is a a series of vines inwardly growing and growing and becoming a series of, you know, arteries and capillaries all over the body and growing greener and thicker. And that is sort of the cultivation of the self, the cultivation of the soul. And so there's this constant radiation of selfhood on the inside and also a constant radiation of selfhood to the outside world. And how are those things connected? How are they at odds also with one another? There's this constant push and pull in that. Um, yes, to gr she, there's a, a quotation about, oh, only 50 pages in, so Joanna is starting to mature, and she, and I guess Liz Spector says, or Joanna says, who knows, what is the perspective here? The way she related to people was becoming increasingly different to the way she related to herself. So there's also this nascent understanding of herself as a person separate to others and we're seeing how that 
also develops, how, how she is relating to herself also as an animal. There's this constant recurring theme of description of her own body and how she feels about it or doesn't feel about it, kind of. Uh, if you want to see, by the way, my, my note-taking practices, if you're terribly uh, fascinated by them, this is how I'm taking notes. Um, what else do I want to say? So much more. This is why it's hard. Life and death, I mentioned. Eternity, I have briefly mentioned. I find it funny that even in this more, I think, slightly more formally straightforward uh, first novel, we already have Clarice Lispector writing a male writer. Um, Joanna's husband, Ottavio, is a writer also, and so, as I mentioned, we sometimes get some things from his perspective as well. And this is such a constant device in Le Spectre of the male writer. She's writing the character of the male writer who also has interactions with her female characters. So it's a very, very interesting that she is wanting to play around with, I think, her authorial voice and her identity, her assert a certain kind of identity or a series of identities as a woman, as a woman writer. Uh, it, I, I was really caught by seeing it already so early um, in, uh, in even this first novel and how much that is going to continue. Oh, Again, with the, the internal organs liana of my reverie, I wonder, I think, if it's partially related to my reading Death by Landscape simultaneously. I can't help but synthesize the various books that I'm reading all at once. The first uh, essay of that collection is dealing with, uh, which I believe is called Death by Landscape, in fact, is dealing with the the almost trope, micro-trope, of women turning into plants in science fiction and, of course, in mythology. She doesn't men Wilk doesn't mention, I think, unless I missed it, uh, Daphne at any point, but, of course, I couldn't help but think of the famous story of Daphne turning into a laurel tree, but there is this kind of recurrent trope of women turning into plants uh, turning into trees, turning into parts of the landscape. And I can't help adding that as an element of Joanna growing, Clarice Lispector growing, and all the different ways in which she's growing as a human being, as just, as just a thought bubble, as an animal, but also even as a sort of plant, as this kind of rhizome of selfhood. I'm also very much tying my reading of this into uh, My Brilliant Friend, which I'm about 80% through. I'm going to try to finish it in the next day, let's say, because, of course, the brilliant friend of that book, uh, Leela, does remind me in her alienness, almost, in her headstrongness and in her brilliance, in her geniusness, geniality, uh, reminds me of... The Spectre, the woman, and also what this goddamn string, uh, but also the figure of Joanna, who is also a little bit something of an alien in her surroundings by being so evolved in some ways, or so uh, sharp and so internalized. Um, so we're not getting Leela's perspective in My Brilliant Friend, largely, but we are getting Joanna's, and I, I definitely, some, definitely see some uh, equivalencies of, you know, bright young woman in the world. I will go deal with that rose bush now, because I hear stirrings downstairs, and I'll talk about Ferrante at some point in the future. Okay, ciao. Hi again. Another evening, another sunset walk.
Hello, land buddy. Good morning from me, my cute pajamas, my cute question mark, bedhead. Uh, actually, it's barely morning. I got up at something like quarter past 11 because I am a sleep monster. Not that I love sleep, you might think. No, I'm just monstrous at sleeping. So I didn't fall asleep until three, maybe half past three last night because I have no sleep hygiene. Anyway, the upshot all of, of all of this is that I finished uh, my brilliant friend last night. It was great. I'm so glad I finally read this book. So I've been saying for several years that I'm not sure if I've read the first of the Neapolitan novels, that I have maybe started it and probably never finished it. I definitely never finished it. I am still unsure whether or not I ever started it something like 10 years ago. I remember it being on my radar just truly a long time ago and then I it's still a mystery whether I read any part of it, but I definitely never read it. What is My Brilliant Friend about? I'm going to plug a couple of people who have talked about this. Many people have read this book, many people have talked about it, uh, but recent to my memory uh, are Renee, uh, so I read this book, who did a whole Ferrante year, and she has a really lovely wrap up of her experience reading all of, or yeah, I think all of Ferrante uh, that she posted earlier in 2023. And just a couple of days ago, Modern Ajima, Yena uh, posted a video of book recommendations, including the Neapolitan novels. <clears throat> Excuse me, I'm still, my voice is still sleepy as well. Um, and I really loved the way that she was talking about the Neapolitan novels in that. So let their experience also guide you. My experience was that it was wonderful. It is such a compelling read. It is about two friends growing up in post-war, post-World War II, um, <clears throat> excuse me, Naples, growing up poor. We have the narrator of the novel and an Elena Ferrante stand-in, Lenu, uh, whose full first name is Elena, also Elena Greco, and uh, her brilliant friend, uh, Lila, who is a cobbler's daughter. And it is about their growing up, the whole quartet is going to be about their growing up. The first book is about their childhood and adolescence. Lenu is a gifted and hardworking child. She's the good one. And Lila is an even more gifted, a sort of preternaturally gifted, but troublesome child when they're growing up. She is first in all of their classes. She seems to grasp things immediately. She seems like she's on a different plane from everybody else, including Lenu. And there is a huge attraction that everybody feels towards her as this kind of troublesome creature, and definitely from Lenu's perspective. So we get their deep, deep bond, but also their, the kind of budding toxicity from the very beginning of a probably reciprocal envy, desire, closeness, and envy. We don't get Leela's perspective of things, uh, but based on her actions also, it seems that she's also envious of Lenu. Uh, Leela does not go on beyond elementary school because she needs to work. But Lenu uh, is afforded the opportunity to continue her schooling, and this is a huge deal. Uh, so their, their lives that have converged so early on begin really quickly to diverge. And that brings about a bunch of different implications about how 
when they're going to grow up. It'll continue even more so in the next books, I know. I'm not going to say too much about the plot happenings, um, but the themes are very, very much about female relationships, female friendships, and love, and if you've read any Ferrante, you know that there is that kind of double-edged fear and desire around the bonds that women make with each other, whether that's best friends or mother-daughter, um, and how the, also those bonds are kind of uh, confused as well sometimes. Class, huge, huge theme of class and mobility because uh, we're talking about a poor neighborhood in Naples and they're really, really stuck there. Um, modernity, as the 50s move on, post-war uh, relics and the, the repercussions of how the previous generation to Nenu and Lila uh, spent the war to some extent, uh, fiefdom and um, cartel and black market happenings, uh, and misogyny. Again, that goes really, really hand in hand with her investigation of how women treat one another and what they feel towards one another because it is so uh, reliant, dependent? No, it is so, so much the result also. That's what I want to say. Um, it is so much the result of patriarchy, misogyny, and also class structures. So much of the interpersonal reactions that they have with one another are informed by their families and how their families treat them, how uh, their classmates and their teachers treat them, how later on boys and men treat them, and how the world beyond their little neighborhood treats them, treats their neighborhood, etc. What they have to do to exist, to subsist in their neighborhood. So I'm not the first one to say this is not novel uh, hard-hitting news, but my brilliant friend, good stuff. I mentioned that I read part of it as an ebook in the Italian. Uh, if you read Italian, it's, it's extremely readable, or if you kind of have middling Italian, if you know Spanish, for instance, try it in the Italian. It's, I find it extremely readable, and so I read about a quarter of it as a book book, and I listened to about three quarters of it uh, in the end Goldstein. I finally know how to pronounce Goldstein. I've sort of attempted to look up whether it's Goldstein or Goldstein before, but at least in the audiobook, the person who reads it, who's great, uh, who's Hilary Hubar, um, Hubbard? Damn it! You get one name right and then you fail on the other. Anyway, she says Goldstein. Uh, and it was a great audiobook, and I'm rambling. That's because I'm still on my first cup of tea. No, it's just because I'm rambling. I am going to try to finish Near to the Wild Heart today and uh, do some reading of maybe the Elvia Wolf as well, Death by Landscape. So yeah, those are the plans, and I'm going to go swimming shortly. It's Hilary Huber. I just listened back to the beginning of the first book. Okay, chat. I think today is going to be the last day that I film for this vlog. It's a very fast turnaround time, but 
I've recorded a lot of footage of me talking, i.e. maybe rambling, about these books. I have a plenty long video already, and uh, today's Sunday, I want to post something tomorrow, Monday. So I'm going to close it off after this last chit chat. I was contemplating kind of the nature of content creation and YouTube creation and reading. And, you know, it has its toxic little tentacles in its own ways. Not so much in my life because it's a very small part of my life, but still, nonetheless, it's inescapable. However, I do have to say that I read a lot this week and I read a lot in a really wonderful way that felt good and profound and was fulfilling for me and it was sort of because I wanted to film a video. The thing that got me going in actually starting to read again was, okay, I need to get these books read, need to, uh, because I need to make a video about them because I said I was going to read these things and it's kind of a, a stupid goalpost in many ways. It's one that should not be overly um, immobile, but it was kind of nice to have a uh, to have homework. I need to start writing more, and I'm trying to see how I can also force myself to do that. So one of the reasons I don't write is because I talk to camera. Uh, it's one of the ways that I can avoid writing. Actually, that I can still have cogent, interesting thoughts about what I'm reading at the very least and not have to write them down. It's a bit of a shortcut for me, but I'm gonna see. I've been saying this for months. I've been saying this for years and I've been saying it for months and even more the past couple of weeks because I have more time. How can I write more? I know how I can write more. I just need to, to actually do it. But well, anyway, I don't desperately need to. Um, I'm saying it here partially to try to keep myself a little accountable. So I need to feed that substack, perhaps. Anyway, bookies. I finished Near to the Wild Heart. It was great. It's not my favorite Lispector, I think, but it's very much a Lispector. It's very um, of a kind. I'm gonna move these books because I'm unhappy with them on my lap. Uh, it's very much of a kind to her other books. The other major theme that I don't think I mentioned was freedom and liberation. I've mentioned that Joanna is in her kind of uh, perspicacious, brilliant manner, a little otherworldly. And that manifests itself in a bunch of different ways. Different people have different reactions to that. Uh, and the same person could have vastly different reactions of uh, finding her at turns sublime or to be reviled. She gets called a viper. She's, as I mentioned, often likened to animals. Uh, so there's that kind of rawness about her, but also something inhuman in an unbodied form. Uh, so some, she's called sublime, she's called virginal and saintly. So she represents a bunch of possible extremes that aren't quite human. And I think that's also tied to her desire for freedom and for autonomy and her own solitude, her own way of doing things. She's a young woman. La Spectre was a very young woman she, when she wrote this. So there's a lot of contemplation of what is good and evil and tied into what is human versus not. She has an interesting relationship to marriage in that she doesn't seem to have a, she certainly does not have a conventional one and she's very ambivalent about marriage and her own marriage, especially as the plot 
as much of their of plot of a plot as there is excuse me goes along but she still wants a child actually and i find that a very interesting thing because for a woman we often associate marriage and child rearing as the conventional kind of uh chained uh poles of the spectrum. The, the conventional woman gets married, has children, and can't pursue a life of the mind. We see it constantly. Whereas the unchained, liberated woman uh, does not go in for a conventional marriage and also does not go in for motherhood. But because Joanna is also allowed to be a biological entity, she can have an unconventional desire for motherhood. And it's true, we, because of patriarchal structures, force women into motherhood as a convention, as a conventional thing, as a thing that ties them down. But of course, motherhood does not have to be bound up to social norms. Motherhood is animal. Uh, which is very much Joanna's viewpoint. So I thought was kind of an interesting development uh, in the latter half of the book. I'm going to read a relatively long passage from the very last page. I don't think you can have spoilers, quite honestly, for this book, nor does it really, really spoil anything. But in the kind of um, final development, of Joanna through her coming of age, <laughs> we culminate in this. I will be strong like the soul of an animal, and when I speak, my words will be unthought and slow, not lightly felt, not full of yearning for humanity, not the past corrupting the future. What I say will resound fatal and whole. There will be no space in me for me to know that time, man, dimensions exist. There will be no space in me to even realize that I will be creating instant by instant, not instant by instant. Always welded, because then I will live. Only then will I live bigger than in my childhood. I will be as brutal and misshapen as a rock. I will be as light and vague as something felt and not understood. And I thought that was a really good encapsulation of a bunch of the themes of how uh, obtuse the writing can be, and even the themes and motives of both Lispector and her protagonist can be how extreme and also um, self-contradictory they can be. So those are some final thoughts for now on Near to the Wild Heart. I have talked a lot about this book, but Lispector lends herself to it. Just ideally, very quickly, a couple of updates on the other two books that I have been reading, because yes, I did start The Magic Mountain. I am about 100 pages in. I have been reading this version, this translation, and I've also been listening to it on audiobook. The audiobook is of this translation, and it is delightful. So if you're an audiobook sort of person, um, I recommend it. It's narrated by Peter Noble, and the, the pace is great. Uh, his pronunciation of French, Italian, probably German, actually, although there is, ironically, not much German to be had, are great. So if that's something that annoys you, like it annoys me, in audiobooks, um, you're all good, and it's important for these sorts of modernist tales that have a bunch of languages peppered in. This is such a romp. This is actually very easy to read. I was... I've been, I've been putting this on a pedestal for years because it's one of the most famous and important uh, high modernist works. And I've liked Mann before and had no problem reading him, but this is so long and I thought it might be a little esoteric and it is, but it is absolutely delightful. 
We're following a young man named Hans, who is visiting his cousin Joachim uh, on a magic mountain at a sanatorium in the Alps, and he meets a bunch of weird characters. It's sort of this quasi-utopia that is representative of the last breaths of pre-World War I Europe. So there are a bunch of people representing all the different, uh, or a lot of the different types of European countries and Europeans that exist prior to World War I. This takes place, I believe, 10 years before the start of the war. And so it's this little hotbed of culture. I'm really interested in the out of placeness and especially out of timeness that is happening in this book because everything moves so slowly. So one of the major themes is how does chronology get shifted and temporality get shifted when you're at the top of a mountain far from the real world and everything just moves so, so slowly. Hans says to uh, another one of the patients at the sanatorium that he plans to be there three weeks and the man replies, ha, it's, I can't even conceive of that. We don't think here in terms of weeks. The smallest unit of time that we think of is in months and people just stay at infinitum. So it was, it's also gonna become functionally part of why this book is so long, because what is going to make this such an epic read is that I assume uh, Hans is going to be stuck there much longer than three weeks. I can't imagine that this is gonna take place in three weeks. I am so peculiarly unspoiled as to this book actually. Uh, which is surprising considering how famous it is, but I really don't know what it's about. And uh, related to time, also just how out of place it is, there's a moment, so after o having spent only one day, now I say this can't possibly uh, just take three weeks. Well, this one day was about a hundred pages, so maybe, but I think, I think time is going to get a little wibbly wobbly, but after his one day, uh, he already, he says that he already feels like he's been there much longer and he's kind of lost a sense of time and place. And he says, Hans says, do you know how it is when you are dreaming and know that you are dreaming and try to awake and can't? So that's definitely the kind of magic mountain aspect already starting to come in. So yes, I have started this. I will be reading it next week. And finally, very, very quickly, I'm not going to talk about Death by Landscape in this vlog because God knows I've talked about way too many other things for too long. I think we're almost at an hour runtime and I refuse to clip because I don't want to. It's my vlog. You come into my house, you play by my rules. Uh, I'm really enjoying it. I'm about three, four essays in and I wanted to read this tiny passage about reading, uh, which reminds me of my experience of Le Spectre specifically, but also just reading in general. Reading can also be sticky as it absorbs the reader. According to Carson, the boundary disintegrating experience of erotic love is akin to the experience of encountering the written word. And it's true there, especially with books like Le Spectre's, there is this boundary disintegrating almost love affair that you have or that I have with books that is wonderful and a little um, erratic and a little bewildering sometimes, but I think that's a beautiful encapsulation of the mania that takes hold of me when I read and especially certain books. So I will leave you on that fateful note. Next week, these are on the docket. I'm going to finish this. I'm going to continue through this. I might get very far. I'm not sure. And voila, that's the vlog. Thank you for joining me in my first week 
here in the countryside by the seaside. Thank you for listening to my long, long thoughts on the Spectre, my slightly less long thoughts on Ferrante, and uh, some ocean views. Bisous!